Hi everyone, happy holidays. I hope everyone's doing well. Hopefully everyone can hear me and, uh, and see the screen. Uh, thanks to Kaylee and all of our great partners at Mentor Public Library for uh, another great year of this series. I can't believe it's December already. Um, it's obviously been a, a much stranger and, and much uh, more different, much different year than we anticipated when, when, uh, when the beginning of the year rolled around, but um, I think we've adapted nicely to being able to do programs in this format. So uh, we've done those here with Mentor Public Library and, and, and with other organizations and places as well. So hopefully we've, um, we've adapted well and, you know, we'll continue to do them this way until, uh, until it's, it's safe to come back to the library and, and actually see everyone's smiling face again. So um, I hope everyone is well and enjoying the holidays. And thank you for taking time out of your your day to spend a little bit of time here with us talking about Sherman's March to the Sea. As Kaylee mentioned, um, we do have the programs all laid out for, this, for next year. So we will continue this series in 2021. Obviously, until it's safe, as I said already, um, they'll be in this format. But, uh, uh, you know, whenever the, the, we get the all clear to, to start doing in-person programs again, then, then we'll, uh, we'll come back. But uh, until then, we've got this option, and, uh, and this is certainly uh, has been a good option for us. So, so the, the topic for today, as you can see on the screen there, is Sherman's March to the Sea. Uh, and this is one that uh, I think I did this program originally, gosh, about six years ago now. So if you've been coming to these for the last, I think this is the 10th year maybe of the, this series, this Civil War series that we've done with Mentor Library. You maybe are starting to, to see and hear some repeats, but um, we, we are starting to kind of redo some of the older programs just because we feel like there's probably a, a pretty good number of people that didn't, haven't seen these yet because we started them so long ago. So, so this one is what we call an encore, uh, meaning uh, one that we've done before. But again, I think it was 2014, we did this uh, for the, the 150th anniversary of the March to the Sea. And of course, the March to the Sea took place through November and December of 1864. So it's, a, it's a, certainly a, a timely uh, a program here. So, so Sherman's March to the Sea, of course, Sherman is William Tecumseh Sherman, the famous Civil War general, uh, native Ohioan, you know, knew James Garfield very well. And interestingly enough, uh, had uh, some other family connections to Garfield as well that I'll, I'll try to to mention as we uh, as we go through. So this is November and December of 1864. So this is very late in the Civil War. We are basically coming to the end of the war here because of course those of you who are uh, even have a passing interest in the Civil War probably know that the war really ends in in the spring of 1865. So we're getting on to the end of the war here. We're getting on to, you know, we're at the point now where Ulysses S. Grant uh, starting in, uh, in the spring of 1864, had been brought to the east by uh, Abraham Lincoln and put in command of all Union forces. And, uh, you know, he's, even though he, Grant, is in the east, he really feels like, and I think with some, with some validity, feels like the war is really being won and will be won in the west. And that's, of course, the, the theater that he, Grant, had come from, and that's also where uh, William Tecumseh Sherman is fighting. And Sherman and Grant are very close and they work very well together. And we'll see a little bit more of that as we, uh, as we go through. So, so really what leads to the March to the Sea is Sherman's siege of the, or Sherman's capture rather, uh, in September of 1864 of the city of Atlanta. And Atlanta, of course, is a major Southern city. It's a major population center. It's uh, something of an industrial center for the South. Uh, and this is a pretty huge psychological blow to the Confederacy to lose the city of Atlanta. We're talking deep south here now, you know, Virginia, uh, where the capital Richmond is, is obviously much further north and, you know, really kind of just barely on the cusp of being in the south. But, but we're talking about the deep south here now when we're talking about places like Georgia and Alabama, where a lot of these, these later fights are taking place. So again, it's a pretty, pretty significant physical and psychological blow to the Confederacy to lose the city of Atlanta. And uh, you can't really understand the march to the sea without understanding a little bit more about who William Tecumseh Sherman really was. So I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes kind of about who he was and his background and kind of how he came to have this theory on, on warfare that he put into practice uh, during the, this event in November 
December of 1864. This is a letter here that you see on screen or an excerpt from a letter that Sherman wrote to the, the mayor of, uh, to the city, the residents of the city of Atlanta uh, as uh, basically right about the time he was capturing the city, right after he captured the city. He says, in part, you cannot qualify war in harsher terms than I will. War is cruelty and you cannot refine it. And those who brought war into our country deserve all the curses and maledictions a people can pour out. So he's kind of in a way uh, chastising the South here a little bit as the people who brought the war into our country. Uh, because of course, by this time in, in 1864, uh, most Northerners feel that the South is at fault uh, for the war, uh, whether they blamed the existence of slavery or they blamed you know, just the secession of Southern states. One way or another, pretty much everyone in the North uh, feels that the South is to blame for the war. So Sherman is kind of you know, wagging his finger a little bit here at Southerners. Uh, but I think he's also previewing the next phase, which of course ends up being the March to the Sea, where he says, War is cruelty, you cannot refine it. The South deserves all the curses and maledictions that people can pour out. And of course, we're gonna see some of that, although not nearly as much as, as Southerners would like you to believe, or some Southerners would like you to believe uh, over the next couple of months as we see the March to the Sea unfold. So who is William Tecumseh Sherman? He's, as I said at the beginning, he's a native Ohioan. And in fact, uh, February of this year was the bicentennial of his birth. Uh, born in February of 1820. He was something, uh, he, his father died when he was very young, uh, when he was only about nine, and he had a huge family. So his father's death, death left his mother with 11 children and basically no income. The same thing actually happened to James Garfield's mother, although there were only four children in that family, James Garfield being the youngest. Uh, but they had a similar situation where, where James Garfield's father died when, when the future president was only about 18 months old and suddenly, you know, left his, his wife uh, with no income and, and with, you know, uh, four children to provide for. But of course, in Sherman's case, it's 11 children that his mother had to provide for. So she starts looking for places for some of the older children to go. Who else can take them in? Because she obviously can't provide for all of them. And the person who takes in young William Tecumseh Sherman is a guy named uh, Thomas Ewing, who's a pretty well-known, even at that point, uh, a, a politician. He was a member of the Whig Party, which of course, by the time of the Civil War, didn't exist anymore. Uh, most former Whigs had become Republicans, although certainly not all. Ewing was, you know, later served as a, as a U.S. Senator. Uh, he was Secretary of the Treasury for a while, and then he was also the first Secretary of the Interior. Uh, which matters to us because, of course, the National Park Service is an agency of the Department of Interior today. So Ewing became kind of the, the, the foster father, almost, if you will, of William Tecumseh Sherman. And then while Ewing was in the Senate, he uh, secured an appointment to West Point for, for young William Sherman. So uh, uh, managed to get his unofficial foster son admitted into the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. So Sherman goes to West Point, uh, graduates in the class of 1840. Uh, he fights uh, in Florida uh, during uh, uh, one of the Seminole Wars there. He's stationed throughout the South, has actually a lot of experience in the South, knows the South very well uh, prior to the Civil War. So he serves in Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, he was very, very disappointed that he was not sent to Mexico to in the Mexican-American War. Uh, and that, um, of course, was something that he viewed as a real sort of stain on his career uh, when so many of his friends and, and fellow officers and fellow West Point graduates were, were fighting in the Mexican-American War. He, Sherman, was not uh, sent to Mexico. He actually spent the, the Mexican-American War uh, in, uh, in California. Fast forward, I guess, about 70 years. The same thing happens to a young man by the name of Dwight D. Eisenhower, who, you know, does everything he can to get to to get sent to Europe to fight during World War One, uh, and 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 doesn't succeed. Uh, Eisenhower, in fact, gets orders to go to Europe just days before the armistice, uh, and so Eisenhower never serves overseas in World War One. And like Sherman, thinks this could 
potentially end his career because here he is, you know, an officer in the combat arms and, and he doesn't have combat experience with so many of his of his uh, West Point classmates and, and, uh, and friends do. Um, so the same thing happens to Eisenhower in uh, 1917 and 18 that happens to, to William Tecumseh Sherman in, in 1847, 40, uh, 48 during the, uh, during the Mexican-American War. Um, at any rate, Mexican-American War ends. Sherman, of course, stays in the army. He gets promoted to captain. Promotion was just uh, infamously slow in the peacetime army. Uh, so it takes uh, Sherman 10 years from his graduation in 1840 to 1850 to be promoted to captain. Um, so it does take a long time for promotions to come through in the, in the, the peacetime army. So in 1850, he gets promoted and he gets married. And the, and the woman he marries named Ellen is actually the daughter of his unofficial foster father. He actually marries the daughter of, uh, of Thomas Ewing. So Ellen Ewing becomes Ellen Sherman in, in 1850. Sherman, kind of like Grant actually, um, resigns from the army for a time in 1853, leaves the army uh, and tries to uh, embark on a business career, becomes the manager of a bank branch in San Francisco. Uh, the bank closes in, in 1857. So then he goes to New York to manage another branch of the same bank. That bank also fails. So, you know, he doesn't have a great, <laughs> a great career in banking. He moved to Kansas for a while and, and tried his hand at the law. This, of course, is the era before you really had to go to law school uh, to, be a, to be an attorney. You just had to apprentice with someone uh, until you were ready to pass the bar exam. Uh, so he tries to be a lawyer for a while. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't do very much. Um, so as the Civil War is, is approaching, Sherman is, you know, 40 years old at this point and uh, really has, had, doesn't have a lot of prospects. Uh, and as I said, that kind of reminds you of, of another guy, that of course being U.S. Grant. You know, Grant's graduated from West Point, served in, he did serve in, Mex in the Mexican-American War, uh, but then after the war, you know, uh, was, was sent to all these sort of uh, posts where he couldn't take his family and was miserable and turned to, to drinking heavily, got into some trouble because of that. Grant too, left the army for a time and, and was just really uh, unsuccessful outside the army. And, and so Sherman and Grant kind of have this, uh, these parallel lives for, for, uh, for quite a bit of time prior to the Civil War. Later, of course, as, as we all know, they both come back to the army and obviously have great success. Uh, and later on, Sherman makes this comment about Grant where, you know, he stood by me when I was crazy and I stood by him when he was drunk. And now, sir, we stand by one another always. Uh, a great testament to their friendship. William Tecumseh Sherman did have uh, uh, sort of a manic episode, I guess you would say, early in the Civil War when people did think he was crazy. I think probably he was just adjusting to being in command and was highly stressed, and it seemed like it didn't really happen again. So Grant, of course, stood by Sherman during that period. This was early in the, in the Civil War. Uh, after they had both come back to the army. But uh, so that's what he's referring to when he says that Grant stood by him when he was crazy. And of course, we all know the, the famous stories, somewhat overblown about Grant and uh, his relationship with alcohol. So um, uh, Grant certainly did have it, those issues uh, as a younger man, but uh, whether or not he was still having those issues during the Civil War is up to debate, at least as far as I know. And certainly he seemed to have conquered it and gotten over it later in, in life, certainly before he was president. In 1859, Sherman becomes the superintendent of a, uh, the Louisiana State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy. Again, this is prior to the Civil War. And, and this was a job he really liked. He liked being in charge of this school. Again, it was a military school, so it really spoke to, to who he was and what are his strengths uh, lay at that point. This school, by the way, eventually transformed into what's now LSU, Louisiana State University. Um, so a very, very well-known uh, school now, but uh, at the time it was the Louisiana State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy. And, he, and again, he really, he really enjoyed this job, and, and uh, it was just more time he spent in the South getting to know Southerners, getting to be around the institution of slavery, 
you know, to be perfectly honest, Sherman wasn't really all that concerned one way or the other about slavery or about the future of, of African Americans in the United States. It's just not something that he really spent a lot of time thinking about. What he could not abide, though, was secession. Uh, and so when, when things started, you know, Lincoln was elected and then southern states began to secede, then Sherman got very concerned and uh, decided that, you know, obviously he was going to, to cast his lot with the Union, uh, even though he'd spent a lot of time living in the Confederacy. Here's a great quote from Sherman. I realize it's a little lengthy, but I, I love the quote. This is really right at the beginning of the Civil War. And I just, it's just amazing to me how, how correct he was and how well he just kind of summarized what really, for the most part, ended up happening. Uh, and he says, you people of the South don't know what you are doing. This country will be drenched in blood and God only knows how it will end. It is all folly, madness, a crime against civilization. You people speak so lightly of war. You don't know what you're talking about. War is a terrible thing. You mistake too the people of the North. They are a peaceable people, but an earnest people and they will fight too. They are not going to let this country be destroyed without a mighty effort to save it. Besides, where are your men and appliances of war to contend against them? The North can make a steam engine, locomotive, or railway car. Hardly a yard of cloth or a pair of shoes can you make. You are rushing into war with one of the most powerful, ingeniously mechanical, and determined people on earth right at your doors. You are bound to fail. Only in your spirit and determination are you prepared for war. In all else, you are totally unprepared with a bad cause to start with. At first, you will make headway, but as your limited resources begin to fail, shut out from the markets of Europe as you will be, your cause will begin to wane. If your people will but stop and think, they must see in the end that you will surely fail. I mean, he just nails it there, doesn't he? I mean, he talks about, you know, you, you're rushing into this. Your cause is terrible. I mean, I think m almost everyone today would agree that, that the cause of secession and certainly the cause of slavery was, were, were terrible uh, and not well thought out. Uh, and I, and I, it's just amazing when he even, you know, he, he notices, he knows the difference between the North being heavily industrial and the South not being industrial at all. And, I, and I'm just amazed at the part where he says, you know, you'll have some success at first. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. You know, we all know that, that the early years of the war were, were pretty good for the South, at least in the Eastern Theater, not so much in the West where Sherman and Grant were fighting. But anyway, I just, I think that's a great quote and it really just kind of gives you a sense of where Sherman's mind was and, and how much he really knew. And oh, by the way, this is his brother, John Sherman who was a longtime member of the House of Representatives and then a U.S. Senator from Ohio. Sherman, uh, John Sherman uh, used his connections to get his brother back into the Army and to get a commission, another commission as a colonel, because again, he had resigned his commission in 1853. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman did lead troops into, uh, into battle at the really the first major battle of the Civil War, which is uh, First Manassas in July of 1861 in Virginia. Uh, he was then promoted to, uh, to Brigadier General and sent to the Western Theater. And it was here that during those early days as a Brigadier General that he had kind of that mental breakdown or manic episode that, that I mentioned earlier. And then, uh, you know, he was given leave for a while, came back, and, uh, and then was, was heavily reliable uh, for, the rest of, uh, for the rest of the war. He, he and Grant, of course, knew each other in the, uh, the pre-war army when they were both in the army before resigning. Grant, of course, was, was making a name for himself at places like Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. And Sherman very much wanted to serve under Grant. One, because he knew Grant uh, and he liked Grant and they, he knew that they would work well together. But also, you know, Grant was having success and Sherman wanted to be part of that. He, he wanted to help put down secession and, and end this war. So they fought to, uh, the, first, the first battle that Sherman commanded troops at as a member of you know, Grant's command was, was Shiloh, which at the time was the bloodiest battle of, uh, in American history. It was a, a two-day battle in April of 1862, fought in Tennessee. 
Uh, James Garfield also was uh, was there, although not until really the very end. I mean, he was basically showing up right as the battle was ending. So he was, you know, he wasn't really heavily involved at Shiloh, but Grant or Gar Garfield rather did show up uh, at Shiloh. And uh, you know, once Sherman got under Grant uh, with that first battle at Shiloh, he was basically under under U.S. Grant until Grant left to go uh, to go take command of all Union forces in, in early 1864. Uh, you can see on the screen there some of the other places that they served together, Shiloh, Vicksburg, Chattanooga. And then, of course, when Grant left the West to go, uh, to go answer Lincoln's call to become the, uh, the head of all Union forces in, in the spring of 1864, uh, Grant, of course, tapped Sherman to take his place as the head of the military division of the Mississippi, which was Grant's official title at that time. So in the spring of 1864, Sherman takes about 100,000 troops into Georgia, and, and really his objective is Atlanta, and he lays siege to the city, and, and the Confederates finally abandon Atlanta on September 2nd, uh, and uh, Sherman, of course, sends that famous telegraph to Lincoln, Atlanta is ours and fairly won. Uh, and this is a critical victory, one, not only for, for the Union military, but it's also a critical political victory for Lincoln because, of course, Lincoln is facing re-election in November of 1864. He's, he's up for re-election. And, you know, Lincoln goes well into the summer of 1864 convinced that he, Lincoln, is going to be beaten in this election. The, uh, the Democratic candidate that's opposing Lincoln is George McClellan, of course, a former Union general himself, who Lincoln had fired twice. So there's a little bit of personal animosity there for sure. Uh, Lincoln's very concerned that he's that he's going to lose this this bid for a second term, and then suddenly good things start happening on the battlefield. Sherman takes Atlanta on September second, and then about five or six weeks later, Philip Sheridan wins a major victory at Cedar Creek in in Virginia, and really basically sweeps the Confederates completely out of the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, and so suddenly as Lincoln is going into this election, he's got two major uh, major victories to kind of to bolster him in in the, in the vote, and of course, obviously Lincoln is 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 reelected. We all know, but uh, those victories at Atlanta and Cedar Creek uh, were really really important. People in the North were finally starting to see good progress, and it was clear that it was at this point pretty much just a matter of time that 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 the Confederacy was kind of on its heels. And so they they didn't feel a need to make a change in 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 the presidential in the presidential office because they felt like the war was was drawing down. So the question after Sherman took Atlanta was, okay, what what do we do now? Of course, in at just a few weeks after taking Atlanta, Sherman proposes this march to the coast to the Atlantic coast. Writes to Grant proposing to take his army from Atlanta all the way to Savannah on the, uh, on the Atlantic coast. I admire your dogged perseverance and pluck more than ever. If you can whip Lee, this is Sherman writing to Grant. If you can whip Lee and I can march to the Atlantic, I think Uncle Abe will give us a 20 days leave to go see the young folks, referring to their, to their you know, their desire both to go see their children, of course. Uh, Grant at first was not sure about this idea. He actually wanted Sherman to move south towards, um, sort of southwest towards Alabama to, to, to Mobile and to really wipe out the remaining Confederate strength there on the, uh, on the, the Gulf of Mexico coast. Um, Lincoln and, and Edwin Stanton, who was Secretary of War, were also skeptical of Sherman's proposed march to the sea because it basically meant they'd be marching away from rather than toward a major Confederate army in the, uh, the Army of the Tennessee, which was at that point commanded by John Bell Hood, who uh, of course uh, is very well known as a, as a pretty impressive Corps commander uh, under Robert E. Lee for, for a couple of years earlier in the war, but is regarded by historians as mo basically a disaster as the commander of the Army of Tennessee later in the war. So anyway, Sherman is proposing to go uh, across Georgia to the Atlantic coast and of course, there's some skepticism here, those higher in command. Uh, Sherman, of course, responded that he, he thought that George Henry Thomas, who was commanding the Union Army of the Cumberland, 
would be fine dealing with, with General Hood's Confederate Army of Tennessee. Thomas, of course, is famous as the Rock of Chickamauga. And if you don't know who gave him that nickname, most indications are that it was, believe it or not, James Garfield. Because <laughs> uh, Garfield was present at Chickamauga as well. And, and so there's a lot of good evidence that suggests that it was actually Garfield that kind of referred to to, uh, to Thomas as the rock there at, at that particular battle. Um, so anyway, Sherman has great confidence in that Thomas can handle Hood. And uh, he also, you know, makes a, a pretty strong case that marching across Georgia like this to the coast is going to allow him to, uh, to really show Southern civilians just how brutal war is uh, and, and can be. And, and with the idea of maybe making them rethink their support of the Confederacy and perhaps put pressure on their elected officials to, to end the war. So, so Sherman is, you know, kind of engaging in, in an early version of kind of psychological warfare here, if you will. Uh, even without a battle, he said, the result operating on the minds of sensible men would produce fruits more than compensating for the expense, trouble, and risk. Uh, so some interesting, uh, again, some early kind of psychological warfare there, I guess you will. Um, the utter destruction of, of Georgia's roads, houses, and people will cripple their military resources. And then finally, I can make the march and make Georgia howl. Uh, and so, you know, Sherman is, is very openly saying he's, he's taking the war to not just Southern armies at this point, but to Southern civilians as well. And he's going to show them just how misguided uh, this entire war has been. So even though Grant was skeptical at first, he actually starts to, to reconsider. And he, you know, kind of gradually starts to get more and more excited about this plan. Uh, and he says, well, if there's any way of, of you getting at Hood's army, I would prefer that, but I trust your judgment. This is Grant to Sherman. Then few, a few days later, Grant writes again and says, on reflection, I think better of your position. So Grant is starting to warm up to the idea. And then a few days after that, Grant said, writes to Sherman, I do not really see that you can withdraw from where you are to follow Hood without giving up all that we have gained in territory. I say then go on as you propose. So Grant seems like maybe he's talking himself into this, into going along with this. Uh, and then a few days after that, finally, uh, great good fortune attend you. I believe you will be eminently successful and at worst can only make a march less fruitful of results than hoped for. So the worst that can happen is, you know, it doesn't, it does, we don't get uh, as, as much uh, out of it as we thought, but ultimately uh, Grant doesn't feel like that's too much of a risk. And he finally approves Sherman's plan to uh, leave Atlanta take 62,000 troops and march down the coast, or, or, or across the state rather, down to Savannah on the, uh, on the coast. So his plan is for four columns on a 60 mile wide front. Again, very large front. He orders his men to carry a 20 day supply of food. They're gonna be taking 3,000 head and head of cattle with them to sustain the army. And then when that is all gone, which it, will be very quickly. I mean, that's not a lot for 62,000 soldiers who have to eat three times a day. Once that is all exhausted, then, then the, uh, the troops will live off the land. They'll forage. This is country uh, in central Georgia that had really, to this point, been untouched by the war. So there's still a lot of animals and, and, uh, and, and farms that had much to offer uh, troops making, uh, the, making this, this march to the sea. Um, there would be, of course, no supply lines other than what they were carrying. Uh, and Sherman knew he would basically be out of touch, out of communication with, uh, with Grant, with Lincoln, with anybody for, you know, as long as it took, which he estimated could be as much as uh, a month or more. He, uh, so as, 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 as they were finalizing uh, between September and October, uh, when they finally started to, to get ready to leave Atlanta and begin the march to the sea, he ordered commercial and manufacturing sections of the city to be burned, basically so that they could not be used anymore by the Confederacy. Uh, retreating Confederates had already burned a lot of stuff too, uh, so that Sherman's troops couldn't use it. So, And we saw similar situations in other southern cities as, as Confederates were abandoning them when Union troops were about to come in and take the city 
uh, they would often set things on fire, really just supplies and such, so that so that the North couldn't couldn't use them. So Sherman's troops move out of Atlanta uh, on on uh, September or excuse me November sixteenth, and they begin you know they they begin this kind of southeastern march toward the city of Savannah, right on the Atlantic coast. Behind us lay Atlanta, smoldering and in ruins, the black smoke rising high in the air and hanging like a pall over the city. And that's Sherman talking about uh, what Atlanta looked like as they were leaving. Uh, this is a great quote here from a, a sergeant from uh, an Iowa unit. Started this morning early for the southern coast somewhere, and we don't care as long as Sherman is leading us. So, you know, great affinity there for, uh, for Sherman from the men in the ranks. And then Lincoln, uh, after having signed off on this, uh, on this march to the sea, says, Grant has the bear by the hind leg. The, and that, of course, uh, the, the bear, of course, is the Confederacy. Uh, the hind leg is Robert E. Lee, of course, in the Army of Northern Virginia up in, up in Virginia. Uh, so Grant has the bear by the hind leg while Sherman takes off its hide. So a great, uh, a great quote there from Lincoln as well. So here's, uh, this is John Bell Hood, the, the Confederate commander of the Army of Tennessee. And he, he did exactly what Grant expected him to do when, when he was going back and forth with Sherman about this plan. Uh, he turns north and heads into Tennessee. And so George Henry Thomas, of course, who Sherman told Grant he trusted to keep, uh, to, to deal with Hood, is now going to have to do that. So he's trying, Thomas now has to keep Hood from marching up through Kentucky and potentially even into Southern Ohio. So imagine the, uh, the public relations disaster if, you know, Sherman takes off on this march to the sea and suddenly a Confederate army invades Ohio. Uh, that's not gonna, that's not gonna bode well for, uh, <laughs> for the march to the sea. So Thomas, you know, kind of hems and haws and, and uh, delays really trying to face Hood. Uh, he blames weather and logistics and supplies and all this other stuff. Uh, and Grant finally has to kind of bring the hammer down a little bit on Thomas and tell him, if you delay attack longer, the mortifying spectacle will be witnessed of a rebel army moving for the Ohio River, and you will be forced to act, accepting such weather as you find. Let there be no further delay. And the result of, of Grant finally pressing Thomas into action is the Battle uh, of Nashville uh, in December of 1864, and of course Thomas and the North win that battle. And that is pretty much the end of, of John Bell Hood's Army of, Army of the Tennessee for the Confederates. Meanwhile, back with Sherman and his, uh, and his men on the march to the sea, uh, he sends 30 to 40 men from each brigade out each morning to uh, basically kind of uh, almost as sort of scouts, I guess you would call them, uh, and tells them to forage liberally so basically grab whatever they can to bring back to the army, food, supplies, any of that, uh, anything at all that they can, uh, that they can get that, that Sherman's army will find useful. These guys were called bummers. You can read the quote there from a, a newly freed uh, uh, slave. Yankee soldiers have noses like hounds. Master hid his horses away out there in the swamp. Some soldiers came along all at once. They held up their noses and sniffed and sniffed and turned into the swamp and held up their noses and sniffed and went right straight to where the horses were tied up in the swamp. Uh, so, you know, those are, that sort of shows the, um, the efficiency of, of northern, uh, northern bummers and, and foragers working, for, uh, working there for, for Sherman's army. Uh, as, as they're marching across Georgia, uh, they of course are running into many, many enslaved people and they, uh, they often will free the enslaved and uh, those enslaved people very often will start following the army, uh, because what else are they going to do? They can't just, you know, kind of sit around, hang around in Georgia, because once the army is, has passed through, they'll immediately be recaptured and re-enslaved. Uh, and so they start following the army, and a lot of times they, they, they end up working for the army. They're paid for their labor. I mean, imagine that feeling, having been enslaved your entire life, and then suddenly uh, you're being paid for your work. I mean, it's just a, a, a totally different experience than than anything that these these folks had ever had ever uh, had ever had before, so they're now realizing the value of work and and what it means to be paid for their labor. Sherman's troops, you know, do sort of create a path of destruction along the way. They're they're famous for destroying railroads because, of course, railroads help move 
supplies and troops for the Confederacy. So they're famous for, uh, for tearing up railroad tracks whenever, wherever they find them so that they can't be used by the Confederacy. Uh, and they uh, come up with these, uh, they, they pry the, the rails loose from the ground and then they, they basically burn them until they can bend them and they tie them basically in, in knots so that they can't be used again. The, 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 the Southerners cannot just lay them back down and, and, and pound them back into the ground so, and, and, and restart the trains. Uh, and they called these kind of jokingly Sherman neckties, uh, the rails pried loose and then tied in, uh, in knots and, uh, so that they couldn't be used again. Sherman's troops also rebuilt bridges and, and, other, uh, and, other, uh, and other things that, that Confederates had destroyed so that Sherman's army couldn't use them. Uh, they cleared uh, obstructions from the roads. I mean, you know, with 60,000 men moving through, um, it's, it's not that difficult to uh, repair bridges and, and uh, move obstructions from roads. And so Sherman's, Sherman's men are making this, uh, making this march actually quite a bit quicker than they expected to. Uh, they often had to deal with Southern civilians, of course, many of them women because of course so many of Southern men were off fighting in the army or had, had served and maybe been killed or were infirm or whatever. And so here's this, uh, this, this one ind indignant Georgia woman. And my husband is a captain in the Confederate army and I'm proud of it. You can rob us, you can take everything we have. I can live on pine straw the rest of my days. You can kill us, but you can't conquer us. And of course, obviously Sherman showed that, that they could be conquered. And then uh, uh, this Illinois major from Sherman's army was lectured by this, uh, this Georgia woman about the, uh, uh, the foremost danger in her view of freeing enslaved people, which was amalgamation, meaning mixing of the races. And then the, the major, you know, kind of interestingly writes down, the old lady forced it on me. And as there were three or four very light colored mulatto children running around the house, they furnished me an admirable weapon. She didn't explain to my entire satisfaction how her slaves came to be so much whiter than African slaves are usually supposed to be. Uh, and so, of course, you can, you know, kind of put two and two together there and figure out that uh, amalgamation was already happening, obviously. <clears throat> also on the march to the sea, Sherman's men often encountered men who had been prisoners, Union men who had been prisoners uh, in places like Andersonville, uh, which was quite awful. And you can see that's a, that's a photo of a, a, a Union prisoner of war there from Andersonville. And uh, it reminds you almost the photos you see of, of people from concentration camps in the Holocaust once they were freed. Uh, just how, you know, how thin and gaunt and obviously not being cared for, not being fed. Um, so, uh, you know, pr pretty awful situation there. Once Sherman's men began to see these, uh, these, these former prisoners and just in what terrible shape they were in. Uh, the march got a little rougher and a little more vindictive after that. And then this, I love this story here. Uh, this Southern woman spits on a Union officer and they don't respond to her at all. They don't say a word to her. They just go burn her house down. Uh, and that's an example of just how, how kind of nasty and vindictive uh, some of this stuff got. Uh, especially after seeing those, what the, the poor shape that so many of these Union prisoners were in. When uh, Sherman learned that Confederate President Jefferson Davis was advising Confederates to use landmines, these, you know, obviously early versions of landmines to obstruct the march, Sherman ordered Confederate prisoners out to dig up suspected mines. So he used he used uh, Southern prisoners to go out and, and dig up mines. So you can see how this was starting to devolve into a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty nasty affair. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, a lot of uh, formerly enslaved people started following the army as, you know, viewing them as liberators, of course. I already said at the beginning, you know, that obviously Sherman wasn't a, uh, wasn't a um, you know, necessarily a friend uh, or very sympathetic to the, the plight of African Americans and uh, said some pretty frankly awful things about black people. Uh, you can see here in the, uh, in the, on the slide, the Negro should be a free race, but not put on any equality with the whites. Frankly, a lot of people said things like that, including at one point Abraham Lincoln. So this was not necessarily all that uh, controversial. 
But then here in this letter that he wrote to a friend in St. Louis, he uses a much more uh, explicit racial term for, for African Americans, uh, saying that, uh, you know, African Americans are not fit to marry, associate, or vote with me or mine. Uh, and so, you know, again, Sherman is not exactly, not a, not a, uh, a stark abolitionist by any means here. <clears throat> again, a lot of early Republicans, a lot of those who fought for the Union were not abolitionists. Uh, you know, they, they didn't feel that that's really what they were fighting for. They were fighting in their own minds to save the Union. Uh, but of course, people like Lincoln eventually realized that you can't really save the Union and put it back together if slavery is still intact, since at the end of the day, slavery is really the root cause of of what everybody is fighting about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Confederates did, of course, try to resist uh, Sherman's troops. They, they harassed Sherman's troops as much as they possibly could. Uh, but, uh, and, and of course, Sherman had nowhere to, he didn't have hospitals or anything like that for, for wounded troops. So wounded troops were either left behind or they just had to go along with the, with the army until they made it to Savannah. You know, this thing lasted two months, and uh, it's actually pretty amazing. Sherman lost, really took seven, only 700 casualties that entire two months. That's killed, wounded, captured, or missing. Not that we want to downplay 700 people that were killed, wounded, captured, or missing, but you would have expected a lot higher casualty numbers for Sherman's, uh, for Sherman's troops. But they actually made the, uh, made the march with, you know, considering how many troops they had, you know, pretty minimal losses. Um, so by December 10th, uh, Sherman, is, Sherman and his troops are kind of at the outskirts of Savannah. Uh, they've moved 225 miles in, in less than a month, so they've moved very, very quickly. Um, there are 18,000 troops in, in Savannah, Confederate troops in Savannah. Uh, Sherman decides rather than attack the city, uh, he'll lay siege to it. That worked at Atlanta. There's no reason it shouldn't be able to work again here at, at, uh, at Savannah. Uh, on December 13th, he actually swings south and makes an attack on Fort McAllister, which is just south of Savannah. Uh, and uh, he makes this attack with a relatively small force, one division, um, and uh, captures uh, uh, captures. Uh, a number of Confederates only loses 11 killed and 80 wounded. Uh, William Hardy was the, uh, the Confederate commander there, and that's a pretty significant loss for the Confederates in that now the, the road to Savannah is pretty, much, is pretty much over. Sherman now has access to the sea uh, because McAllister is kind of right on the, on the ocean, and so more supplies can now be sent to Sherman. Again, he's been living without supply lines for a month now. So now supplies can be sent down to Sherman and, and you know, be gotten from, from, uh, from the water because now with McAllister, Fort McAllister out of the way, he has access to the ocean. Uh, he now has communications as well. Um, and so uh, he learns that one of his children has died. Uh, his, his youngest, uh, his newborn son, Charles, who was just born in June, died uh, December 4th. Uh, and that was the second child that the Shermans had lost in just over a year. So, you know, certainly, uh, personally, not a very happy time for, uh, for Sherman. Uh, and then at some point, he receives word from Grant to, uh, uh, you know, once he's done with Savannah, to begin prepping to move his army north. Uh, so he's gonna move north uh, to join the fight against Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. So they've marched all the way from Atlanta to Savannah, and now they're going to start cutting north from Savannah up towards uh, through the Carolinas and into Virginia to try to link up with Grant to try to put the, uh, the final blow to Robert E. Lee. Hardy and uh, the Confederate commander from Fort McAllister and his troops finally abandon Savannah uh, on December 21st. They start fleeing north into into the state of South Carolina. And so on December 22nd, uh, Sherman is able to, uh, to march into Savannah and sends this very famous telegram to Abraham Lincoln. I beg to present to you as a Christmas gift, the city of Savannah with 150 guns and plenty of ammunition and also about 25,000 bales of cotton. 
And uh, Lincoln's reply is, uh, of course, jubilant. Many, many thanks for your Christmas gift, the capture of Savannah. But what next? I suppose it will be safe if I leave it to you and General Grant to decide. And what a departure this was for Lincoln, too, to finally have generals that he could count on enough to just say, I trust your judgment, do what's right, bring this war to a close. Because for the first couple of years of the war, Lincoln didn't have that. You know, he was just constantly sort of perplexed by generals who, who wouldn't fight or, or, you know, went into battle piecemeal or, or just uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't bring victory to the Union. And, you know, Lincoln was very much in line with, with the way that people like Grant and Sherman thought, which is, who cares about Richmond? Yes, it's the Confederate capital, but if we capture Richmond, so what? There are still hundreds of thousands of Confederate soldiers running around out there. We need to destroy their armies, and then taking Richmond will be easy. But he had so many generals early in the war that, uh, that were obsessed with capturing Richmond. Uh, and then you get these, those were generals primarily in the East, but then you get these generals in the West, like Grant and Sherman, who thought the same way, which is, you know, the, the main thing to do is knock out the Confederate armies, because then there's nobody left to defend a place like Richmond or Atlanta or Savannah. Uh, and so they were much more in tune with uh, this very aggressive offensive strategy that, that Lincoln wanted to, uh, wanted to follow. And so when he finally got generals like Grant and Sherman, uh, he could step back, he, Lincoln, could step back just a little bit and and kind of leave it in their hands because he knew that they thought the same way and he trusted that they would get the job. As far as the impact of the March to the Sea, it was, uh, you know, it was written about overseas. This is a paper from Scotland, calling it the highest achievement which the annals of modern warfare record. London, the London Times military history has recorded no stronger marvel. It was obviously viewed very negatively uh, in the South. Uh, it, it really made a lot of Confederates uh, and Southerners feel like the war was probably lost, that they probably were not going to be able to turn it around, uh, and they were not going to be able to, in fact, maintain the Confederacy and, and become an independent nation after all. You know, the, 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 the march had a very uh, important and huge impact on the war. Uh, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, another Ohioan, by the way, uh, comes down and visits uh, Sherman in January of 1865. Uh, he asks Sherman to organize a meeting with uh, some of the, uh, the most prominent African-American citizens of Savannah. Uh, so Sherman does that, invites 20 black men into this meeting, most of the ministers. And then at one point, Sherman actually asks, or I mean, rather Stanton asks Sherman to excuse them, in other words, get out, so he can talk candidly with these these African-American leaders about the conduct of Sherman's soldiers, because he's been hearing all these reports about black people being mistreated by Sherman's, uh, Sherman's men. And, uh, and, and of course, Stanton finds out that by and large, those, those reports have been extremely overblown. Yes, there were some isolated cases, but it was not a, you know, a large scale uh, plot to treat African-Americans in Savannah poorly. Uh, and they say to, to they tell Stanton, his, his meaning Sherman's conduct and deportment toward us, characterize him as a friend and gentleman. We have confidence in General Sherman and think that what concerns us could not be in better hands. So uh, actually a, a pretty strong endorsement there of Sherman from African-American leadership of Savannah. At one point, uh, Sherman considers trying to, uh, to take ships to put his army on ships to move north to link up with Grant and, and attack Lee and eventually decides no you know marching from Atlanta to Savannah worked out just fine there's no reason we shouldn't be able to march through South Carolina and North Carolina uh, and do the same thing all over again and so that's ultimately what they decide to do. Uh, Sherman and his troops leave Savannah in early February of 1865, and they start moving north. They enter South Carolina and then up into North Carolina as well. Back in, uh, in Virginia, uh, Lee, of course, is trying to, uh, to escape Grant, uh, and of, of course is, is not having much success in doing that. He wants to try to escape and link up with other, uh, with other Confederate troops commanded by Joseph Johnston. 
Lee finally realizes he's not able to do that, and he, he surrenders the Army of Northern Virginia to Grant uh, on April 9th, 1865. Most people think of this as the end of the Civil War. It's really not. Um, Sherman is still marching north through the Carolinas. Uh, he finally catches Joseph Johnston and his Confederate troops, and they surrender to, to Sherman on April 26th. So this is, you know, two weeks or more after Lee surrendered to Grant. That is pretty much the end of major campaigning in the war. There are still a few other Confederate generals who don't surrender, who have not surrendered yet. I believe the latest surrender of a Confederate general was late May or early June, actually. So yes, we tend to think of April 9th when, when Grant, uh, or when Lee surrendered to Grant as the end of the Civil War. That's not quite true. Um, there was still some fighting going on, especially with Sh between Sherman and, and uh, the Confederate General Thomas. So what do, what's our assessment of the March to the Sea? And obviously this has been a very cursory look at a major event that you know, went on for, for over a month. Uh, but what's, what's the assessment? It's, it's hard to, to view the March to the Sea as anything but successful. Um, I mean, it's certainly, certainly Sherman accomplished all of the, uh, the things he wanted to accomplish by making the march. He lived off the land. He caused destruction to the countryside in Georgia and made Southerners feel like the war was hopeless uh, and that they were going to lose and maybe lost, conf you know, made them lose confidence in the Confederacy. Yes, it was aggressive and, and it was definitely, you know, especially if you're one of those Southern civilians, it was somewhat brutal. Uh, it, it was not, however, as bad as many Southerners like, even today, but especially after the, right after the war ended, it was not nearly as, as bad as some of them would, would like for people to have believed. Um, there are elements in the South today where, you know, Sherman is still cursed uh, and it's 2020, almost 2021. Um, and, so, and yes, you know, Sherman did, did cause a lot of damage in Georgia, but uh, there's a lot of uh, fairly recent scholarship that, that shows that uh, he was actually a lot more restrained than he could have been. Uh, so as bad as, it, as this, this event was for Southerners in Georgia, it actually could have been a lot worse. Um, you know, sure, as, I, as I've said a couple of times, you know, Sherman, again, is no great friend of, of the black man in, in the South, and, and that was certainly uh, continued to be the case during the March to the Sea, after the March to the Sea, and after the Civil War. But, uh, but at any rate, you know, he, he did uh, allow former, former slaves that, that, that his army freed as they were moving through Georgia to follow along with the army and to work for the army and, and, to, and he paid them for their labor. So at least there's, uh, there, that is something to be commended. Uh, and then I think we have to acknowledge that, you know, the, the deep friendship that he had with Grant and the trust that they had with one another uh, was a critical factor here in the success of the March to the Sea, but even larger on the success of the war in the West and really bringing the war to a close. Um, so I think that that, uh, that friendship cannot be underestimated. And in fact, there's one scholar who's written an entire book just on this relationship between Grant and Sherman and how vital it was to winning the Civil War. And then, of course, as, as I now am ready to try to answer any questions you might have, I'll share this final image with you. And this is uh, William Tecumseh Sherman uh, as the commanding general of the United States Army. And he held that job from 1869 to 1883. Uh, this, of course, includes during the very brief presidency of James Garfield, but in fact, it's all even more interesting to note that the person that he replaced in 1869 was none other than Ulysses S. Grant, and the reason he replaced Grant was because, of course, Grant went to become president of the United States and therefore had to leave his job as commanding general of the army, and then, of course, Grant wanted to ensure that Sherman uh, became the next commanding general, which he did, and he held the job until he retired in 1883. So.